Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Five Really Great Examples of Lawyers Using Social Media, presented by Guy Sakalaki. My name is Stephanie Phelan, I'm a Marketing Manager at MyCase and I will be your host today. First, I'd like to give you a few tips about participating on GoToWebinar. The webinar control panel is on the right hand side of your screen. This is where you can control audio, chat with me, and submit questions. Please use the questions pane to submit your questions at any time during the webinar. I'll be collecting those questions and saving them to ask you at the end of the presentation, but please don't wait until the very end to shoot those over to me. Also, please note that these slides and the recording will be available by end of day tomorrow on the MyCase blog, and it will also be emailed to all registrants. When you close your webinar today, a five-question survey will pop up. All you have to do is answer one of these survey questions, or all of them, and you'll be entered to win a $100 Apple gift card. Lastly, the Twitter hashtag to follow the conversation is hashtag social media for lawyers. Uh, side note, this webinar has been approved by the Wyoming State Bar and the Florida Bar for one hour of general CLE credit. If you're a Florida Bar member, note CLE course 2199C to self-report your CLE. I'll also send this information out in the GoToWebinar chat pane. Today's webinar is hosted by MyCase, so before we jump into things, I'd like to give you a quick overview. MyCase is a web-based law practice management software that takes care of your daily practice requirements for calendaring, contact management, document management and templates, time and billing, client communications, custom workflows, and more in one solution at an affordable price. MyCase is priced for solo and small firms at just $39 a month per attorney and $29 a month per paralegal or support staff. We also offer MyCase websites for our customers. The cost to set up and build your website is only $500, and then there's a $50 per month maintenance fee. We use a beautiful, modern, professional design built for your firm. The websites contain social media and blog integration, and best of all, a client portal, which is completely integrated with your MyCase software, so now you and your customers can log into MyCase directly from your website. Now for a new feature. Approved MyCase customers can accept payments directly from client checking accounts, also known as eCheck or ACH payments, for free with no third-party integration required. By linking MyCase's legal billing tools to your operating and trust accounts, you can seamlessly accept online payments into your MyCase account. Best of all, the eCheck payment feature was created with the unique needs of lawyers in mind. Unlike other general business payment processing options, it's designed to protect your trust account so you can rest easy knowing that it complies with trust account regulations. Last but not least, we enjoy hosting educational events for professionals in the legal industry, and that's why we're all here today. So let me tell you a little bit about our presenter. Guy Sakalakis is a co-founder and director of AttorneySync, a digital marketing agency for law firms. He has been helping lawyers use the internet to gain clients since 2008. As a lawyer, licensed in Michigan but not practicing, he is familiar with the unique considerations and challenges of effectively marketing a law practice. You've either joined us on the webinar today because you've heard Guy speak, read his articles, an attorney at work or lawyerist, or you just really want to find out how to pronounce his name. Guy Sakalakis, I hope I did your name justice. I'm going to let you take it from here. Thank you. Stephanie, thank you so much. You did a great job with my name. Very impressive. Uh, everybody, thanks for joining today. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, we're going to jump right into it with a poll question. So our first poll question yeah, go ahead and is go ahead and read that. ready? Here we go. Does social media work? for marketing a law practice? And you can answer, yes, absolutely. I'm on the fence. Or three, no, social media doesn't work for law practices, or at least you haven't seen it work for law practices. Okay, perfect. So we've got our first poll running. If everyone can go ahead and cast your vote, 
Looks like the majority has voted and we'll close the polls. Okay. And for our results, 58% said yes, absolutely. Social media works for marketing a law practice. 40% are on the fence. And 2% said nope, doesn't work for law practices. Great. So a pretty good mix. Um, a lot of people that are already persuaded. Um, but for those that are still on the fence or that uh, haven't seen it work yet, hopefully today you'll come away with a couple of ideas that you might be able to put to work at your practice. So this is, uh, there's a photographer that actually did a series of photos. I encourage you to go check it out uh, when you have a chance. Um, but they basically took uh, a bunch of daily life photos and they uh, cropped out the smartphone. Uh, and so, you know, especially the busy lawyers that are constantly on their smartphones, I'm sure can understand and relate to this. But this is a new reality for a lot of people, for better and worse. Um, you know, I, I'm not here to make judgment about uh, the usage of mobile devices, but they're here, they're not going anywhere, and there's a lot of people on them a lot of the time. And some of those people are your potential clients um, and colleagues and referral sources and jurors and judges. Um, and so I kind of wanted to set the stage with that as the, you know, the kind of the first piece of evidence that, you know, look, people are online. Uh, the question is how do you interact with them in a way that um, you know, builds new relationships and develops uh, your reputation for your firm? And so does social media work for marketing a law practice? Uh, I think a, perhaps a lot of the people that might be a little bit skeptical or that uh, you know, aren't convinced quite yet, the reason is because when they go online and see what some of the things that lawyers are doing, or they've tried this kind of thing themselves, they see this kind of thing. And I, so many times I talk to lawyers and they say, you know, I tried Twitter to market my law practice. I tried Facebook to market my law practice. And when you go and really start peeling back the layers, you find this is the kind of stuff that they're doing. And, you know, it shouldn't, hopefully it doesn't come as a surprise that people that are uh, doing this kind of thing online, of course it's not working, right? Uh, no one wants to engage with this. No one's having conversation with this. This is trying to take the old school, you know, free consultation advertisement and a, you know, rather tasteless one at that with some spelling problems um, and apply it to social media. And I think that's one of the uh, major things that I want to kind of dispel today. And the examples that we're going to talk about hopefully will resonate with you uh, how social media really can work versus this kind of stuff. So we're going to dive right into another poll question. A lot of poll questions today, uh, but it's always nice to get the audience's uh, impression. So how do most people find and hire lawyers today, right? Uh, is it Google? Is it Facebook? Referrals? Or television ads? What do you think? Okay, great. Thank you. I've launched that poll and the votes are coming in. And all right. Um, go ahead and cast your final vote, please. I'm going to close the polls now. And our results. Okay. Um, so this is what people think and how most people find and hire lawyers. 27% say from Google. We had zero. Zero percent say Facebook. 72% um, referrals and 2% television ads. So definitely heavy on the referrals. Excellent. This is a very smart group. And so this is a recent survey. Uh, this firm actually does it, a firm conducts it uh, every couple of years. And this is what they came up with. So again, this is just one survey. This is not the uh, end-all be-all on this. Ben. But I think it pretty closely tracks what the audience thought, which is uh, family, friends, and work referrals, uh, Google, and then Facebook down the bottom. However, I think one thing to think about as we go through this is that when people are taking these types of surveys, what's happening is, is that people are looking to friends, family members, and other referral sources, but a lot of that is moving to whether it's a Facebook Messenger app or WhatsApp or a text message. So there's now this kind of interplay or a Twitter direct message. We're seeing that more, and so I think it's just something to bear in mind that referrals, relationships, reputation are still the core of client development, but now some of those conversations now have moved into 
uh, social media platforms. Um, and so here's some other things from the study. I've, you can check it out. Uh, it's Moses and Ruth is the firm. Uh, you can, they've, the survey has been uh, posted around. Uh, if you search for how people find a lawyer, you'll probably find it. Uh, but you're, you'll notice that finding information about people about lawyers online is becoming the expectation, and that's the that's where things are, are really starting to gel for a lot of lawyers. Where it's you know I know people are online. I'm convinced that they have this expectation to find information about me online, but what? how can I deliver that information and how can I stay in touch with people, remain top of mind, uh, so that when they're, you know, whether it's someone they know or uh, their own personal needs for a lawyer, that they think of you. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, you know, this aspect really hasn't changed. People hire lawyers from people that we know, like, and trust. And this is a lot of friends, families, maybe employer, former lawyer. Um, but there are, these are the traditional types of word of mouth referrals. And so the first kind of uh, conceptual mindset I want you to start thinking about is this idea of real law firm stuff, um, which I borrowed from Will Reynolds from Sierra Interactive, really smart guy, but you can check out the post afterwards. But the point here is, is that lawyers that do well in a lot of the traditional reputation, relationship building activities and take that stuff online, those are the ones that are having success. We're standing for something, inspiring social change, educating, being active in your community. We're going to talk about how those things now, those real world activities, uh, carry over online and, and have an, an impact on a variety of uh, aspects to web presence. So uh, another takeaway, I think, if you're going to think about something to get you in the mantra, the mindset of uh, what we're talking about here, you know, social media becoming the new word of mouth, or at least it's playing a big role in that. So uh, even those conversations that were occurring offline, now they're going online, and we're going we're to jump into how that translates. So one of the most common ways, whether they get you from a uh, word of mouth referral uh, or something else, at some point someone's probably going to look you up online. And so when, for a lot of people, that's going to be Google. So uh, this is an example of a firm here in Chicago. and. You know, if you type in the firm's name, you get the firm website, site links. But if you'll notice, and this is something that a lot of lawyers don't recognize, and those that are reluctant to participate on Facebook or Facebook pages, Facebook has a lot of domain authority. And so when you build a Facebook page for your firm, and when you're doing great work and having happy clients, and they and where it's permissible, because I know some states you've got there's some issues around this, um, when clients go or colleagues go online and go onto Facebook to leave reviews or ratings of your firm. These are some of the first things that people are going to see when they search for your firm online. And so, uh, again, we'll, we'll dive into more some deeper examples, but this is one really strong example for uh, you know having a Facebook page and engaging there and encouraging people to uh, participate with your firm there because you're gonna, people are going to find it when they search on your name. So another example, um, we're going to have more than five examples, but uh, I. Thought we'd throw in a couple extras. The this is a great example. Michigan Auto Law, Steve Gersten, um, you know, using this uh, commitment to Toys for Tots, and then sharing that online. So sharing good works of the firm is a really effective uh, way to engage audiences online. You know, people enjoy uh, when seeing firms giving back, seeing lawyers giving back. You know, especially their lawyer, you know, they can something they can be proud of. And then notice some of the, the technical things uh, like uh, you, you including the Toys for Tots Foundation. That will notify Toys for Tots that, you're, hey, you're helping to spread the word about this. That will get Toys for Tots uh, more likely to share it. Um, and then you can start to see on Facebook, you can start to measure things like reach, how many people saw it, whether, whether or not people are sharing it. And that's what I really, that's another big takeaway is, I don't think you should, my advice is not to focus on how many Facebook likes you have. Um, those, those kind of metrics really don't have as much meaning as things that, you know, these engagement metrics like, hey, 100 people commented on this post or 50 people shared this post. Um, because that's, that's them taking action and doing more than just liking a page. You know, we've become so obsessed with these follower numbers and page likes, and they, and they really don't have a lot of meaning. But the engagement metrics, I think that's really where, uh, if you're going to measure stuff, that's a, a good place to start. Um, so here's another example. You know, talking about localized, uh, you know, this firm's in Michigan, talking about localized issues 
news issues uh, that you're writing about on your blog and then sharing those on social media. Again, it's a type of things that people really want to see. And if you look at it, you can see, hey, you've got a bunch of people that are at 487 comments, right? Like 317 shares. So tapping into those local issues that people are passionate about, um, even if it, you know, this is tangentially related, right? This is a uh, story about roundabouts in Kalamazoo. Uh, it's not the, which you t tend to see with a lot of uh, auto law firms or injury law firms, like the regurgitated news story. You know, there's a post about this. It's not, a, it's not about a specific, you know, accident on a particular highway. And people are passionate about this because they're dealing with it as part of their daily lives and their commute. Um, another thing, this is from uh, the uh, Facebook page, is email sign-up. That's another big thing I want you to come away with today. You, this, so this is a, in this example, you can see you can add a MailChimp email sign-up so that uh, people that you know, are engaged with your page can sign up for email addresses. I think email addresses are going to become increasingly important uh, as people become better and better at filtering. Um, if you can get inside, if you can get into someone's mailbox with messaging that they actually want, so you know all this has got to be permission-based opt-in emails, but the emails, as we'll see down, we talk about some of the paid social promotion, are really becoming the uh, important lynching pin for uh, sending custom audiences. So, you know, whether there's a custom audience on Facebook or a custom audience on Google. So I really encourage you to find ways to encourage more people to sign up for whether that's firm news or tips on a particular subject or a guide download um, where you can demonstrate your knowledge or just share something interesting locally uh, you know, some of the, there is, we'll talk about it in the future, some of these things have nothing to do with uh, practicing. They actually have to do with whether it's a charitable cause that people are passionate about or an organization that, they, that they're that they involved with. Uh, and, and, and using your Facebook page as a vehicle for uh, sharing that kind of thing. Here's another example. Um, friends from, from Consult Webs, I think, shared this one, or uh, this might have actually been uh, friends from Ovu Interactive, both uh, companies that assist with this kind of thing. Really great example here, doing this pet of the week. And again, 350, 35 people like this, 60 share. So it's, you know, who doesn't like dogs, right? Well, I'm sure there's plenty of people that don't. But the point is, is that this is the type of thing that, uh, you know, showing the support from your firm uh, for this particular cause, sharing it, using the pet of the week tag so people can easily find it. Uh, making it local, tying it to the animal society. These are all things that people actually want to engage with on Facebook and, 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 and other places around the web. But if you start to get a sense of the difference between this kind of thing uh, versus you know, free consultation with dollar signs, you start to get a sense of how this stuff actually works much more effectively. Uh, this is an example from LinkedIn, actually. Uh, LinkedIn is a great, if, you're, if you rely on referrals from businesses and from other lawyers, LinkedIn can be really powerful. Uh, LinkedIn has a social publishing component to it, which means you can publish something on LinkedIn and then people that you're connected with or people that are following your firm, uh, for firm's company page on LinkedIn uh, can see that, comment on it, share it. Uh, but, you know, the, the real advantage here is that LinkedIn has professional intent. So whereas Facebook, you've got pictures of dogs and uh, so that might be somewhere you share some, some of your charity work. LinkedIn, you can get into much more of the professional type of things. And so this is an example of Carl Schusterman, an immigration attorney. Uh, really good job of covering major immigration updates and issues. And it's really become the go-to source for uh, following, you know, visa statuses and things like that. So. Uh, again, standing for something, being a leader on a particular subject, uh, publishing on it, these are really great uses for social media. Uh, Grilling with Gallucci, this is a little bit more of a just fun one, uh, but again, posted this recipe for burgers and shared it on uh, Facebook. I think they put some uh, promoted promotion, social promotion around it. I think this was the Obu Interactive one, in case you wanted to follow up on that. But it's, you know, it's just a really great example of putting some personality to this firm. You know, I think that's one thing that lawyers, uh, some, some lawyers struggle with is, is that they, they get in this, this blinder mindset of like, all right, this is direct response marketing. This is uh, billboard opportunity and park bench and city bus advertising just online. And that kind of stuff, people are more likely to block uh, or hide from their feed. 
but the stuff that's, you know, if you've got, if you're passionate about something and you share that, you should show some personality, you're going to come up in the feed of the people that are connected to the page. You're also going to come up in the feed of those that they're sharing with uh, and also those that uh, like it. So again, it's that those engagement metrics that really take advantage of that networking effect uh, that social networks provide. Here's another example. Now this one is uh, from Facebook Notes. So a lot of people don't know that Facebook, you can post long form content on Facebook too, not just in your feed, but if you add the notes, uh, again, because Facebook is, uh, has high domain authority, it's, it really can be used as an additional publishing platform. That's not to say that it's, you should use this instead of a blog or your own website, but it's another avenue to social publish in a way that people can comment, share. Uh, that also gets, uh, some of these will get vacuumed up in search engines, especially LinkedIn, does really well uh, in organic search results. So it's a, it's a way to uh, publish in another vehicle that can earn attention from people that are interested in the subjects that you're writing about. Uh, I wanted to say a word about comments. This is a example of uh, the comments evolved WordPress plugins. So if you if your site or your blog is on WordPress, and I encourage you to consider WordPress, uh, but this plugin is nice because it allows for a variety of different comment options. And so you can just put the Facebook comments uh, widget on your site if you want, or you can use just like the default WordPress or Discuss or Google Plus. This one gives you a variety of options, but Participating in comments is a whole other way to engage beyond just posting things on Facebook. Um, you know, becoming a regular comment contributor at sites where uh, referral sources are, or whether where other potential clients are, or whether other people that are interested in similar uh, activities or subjects as you are. Uh, I think you know it, it's it's a it's an untapped resource to a large extent that that can be very effective to demonstrate knowledge or just socialize. Uh, I, I pull out uh, Bill Marler frequently because he does such a great job online. Um, you know, he is the food safety lawyer expert, and through you know his great work as an attorney, of course, but through also becoming this go-to source through places like Twitter and through his um, you know, some of the things he does on Facebook and some of the other social media platforms, has really developed this uh, reputation as the go-to person in this niche. So if you have a niche practice, uh, social media can be a great way to share, uh, you know, updates on a particular subject. And again, this is the kind of stuff that even this, you'll see the CDC will reference uh, some, of the, some of the posts that he makes, some of the articles, some of the stories that he covers as well. So always a great example. Um, same thing with SCOTUS blog, right? So, you know, it's, if if you read the lawyer who um, Thomas Goldstein, who actually started this, you know, a long time ago, it started out as a kind of a marketing vehicle. But when he re what he realized was when he actually switched to just covering uh, what's going on at the at Supreme Court, this became a very powerful tool for making connections, developing reputation, building relationships. And so again, I think if you, you know, I'm not saying that you're going to necessarily recreate uh, Marler's blog or Scotus blog, but I think it's important to get in that mindset of instead of you know trying to be everything to everybody or not really zoning in. I think this is another example of how you can develop a subject matter expertise and share that kind of stuff on social platforms. Which brings us to our third poll question. So if you were nodding off, now is your chance to jump back in. And the question is is actually kind of a complete this sentence, I suppose, more than a question, but. A Facebook custom audience is A, a curated list of your closest Facebook friends, or I guess two, a list of emails or phone numbers used to advertise on Facebook, or three, visitors to your website from Facebook found in Google Analytics. Okay, great. Thanks, Guy. And great. The votes are pouring in. So if everyone can please complete your vote, I will go ahead and close the poll. Okay, and love that, how fast these results are. Okay, so Facebook custom audience is 28% that is curated list of your closest Facebook friends, 19% that a list of emails or phone numbers used to advertise on Facebook, and then we have our majority, uh, which is 53%, say visitors to your website from Facebook 
found in Google Analytics? Great, so this is a huge learning opportunity moment. The correct answer is actually number two, okay? And this, we're gonna jump into the subject of paid social promotion, which might be new uh, to a lot of people. So I'm gonna say a few words about it, especially in the context. We're really gonna focus on Facebook here. So there's, a, there's organic reach in Facebook and there's paid reach. So organic reach is people that naturally are finding you online. It's probably some of your friends that they're connected with you on Facebook, people that follow your page. Um, and then there's paid social promotion, which is actually paying Facebook to boost your content or to show an ad or something like that. And so we're gonna focus on, so uh, just for a little context, Facebook, because Facebook uh, needs to make money, has really sh dialed the organic reach numbers back. And so what that means is they're making businesses pay for uh, promotion uh, and, and reach to a larger extent. And so you, you'll really notice as you start to play around with it that you have to hit a critical mass of reach in order for your posts and your content to take off. You know, so assuming a lot of people get frustrated because they're like, you know, I followed all of everything you said with, you know, I'm sharing stuff regularly, we're doing a lot of charity work, but it's just not catching fire. And unfortunately, you've kind of got to work yourself out of this hole of the organic reach, the lack of organic reach. Uh, the good news is, is that it's not very expensive. I mean, you can get, you, you can get clicks on, uh, clicks and impressions on Facebook for pennies. Um, you know, 10 cents is a pretty good number for, uh, if you can get 10 cents a click to your website, I think that's a, a great target, but it obviously it just depends to a large extent on the campaigns that you're running. Uh, but here are some of the, I just wanna run through some of these examples of some of the objectives that you can do uh, for custom audiences. So you can boost your posts. That would be if you just shared something and you wanna get more exposure for it, uh, trying to gain some new likes to the post or maybe some shares. You can promote your page that actually is trying to drive more likes to your specific page. So if you're just brand new to it, you might build a, a, an audience uh, that's very local, or if you have email, if you already have email lists and you want to, some of those people to uh, see some of your messages on Facebook, you might build a custom audience with those email lists to promote your page. Uh, sending people to your website, you know, this, is a, this has a lot of different valuable applications because if, you know, if you're sharing uh, socially interesting content and someone clicks through to your website and where it's permissible, and depending on your practice and depending on which state you're in and depending on what you're actually putting on your website, you can do retargeting, which means that then you can show them uh, ads on search or uh, you know, Google Display Network or managed placements and your cost per clicks will be a lot lower. So this is kind of a, for the more advanced users, taking visitors that are engaged with you on Facebook, getting them back to your site, and then retargeting them in a different channel. Very, very effective. Um, of course, you can do conversions. So you can say, hey, I want to drive direct response, whether that's a free consultation request or some kind of other uh, conversion event on your site, download a guide. I I'll caution you, though, again, if, you if you're doing some heavy traditional lawyer advertising, I think you're going to find that this isn't as effective as you might think. You know, Again, if you're comparing it to search, Search, you have, people have intent, they're looking for, whether that's lawyer, they're looking for you specifically. Facebook's kind of like, hot, more like high-tech passive TV where it's much more targeted perhaps, but people aren't there to look for your ads. And so it's kind of this top of mind awareness thing, but um, I'm not saying it doesn't work. It's just gotta be a little bit more, if you have different expectations if you're gonna do direct response. And then events. Um, oh, I skipped, I'm sorry, I skipped reach people near your business. They have a local, uh, promotion of business similar to what uh, Google would be, but I think that's a, a good thing to investigate. Uh, if you do events, if you do speaking engagements, if you participate with organizations that have events that they put on Facebook, great way to get uh, messages out, great way to get more uh, visibility for the event is actually creating a Facebook event and promoting that. Uh, and then you can do offers. I, 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 we've done some offers in the past, hasn't been uh, our favorite thing to do but that's another option as well. And then there's video views, which uh, we'll talk about in some of the metrics for that. So another way you can create audience, of course, is by Facebook. Besides the custom audience, you can actually build an audience based on demographic information or interests and behaviors or location. I'd caution you on this. Make sure you're being very specific and tracking where you're actually getting these uh, likes and uh, exposure because the tracking in Facebook is not as good as you might want it to be, and so I think you gotta keep a close eye on that. 
but it is a good way to do some targeted, uh, you know, if you're doing a local story, so you know, the story about the roundabouts in Kalamazoo, obviously people in Kalamazoo are going to be more interested in that, so, you know, targeting people around the Kalamazoo area with boosted posts makes a lot of sense. And then video, and again, you can do a lot of interesting things with videos, whether you're just um, you know, sharing firm news or you're, you know, uh, you did a presentation uh, or you're doing some, if you're, if you're if you do a lot of, uh, get a lot of lawyer referrals or if you're trying to build those relationships, uh, doing some of the uh, lawyer education series can be really effective. Uh, and again, the, you can boost these as well. So this is an example, you can check it out. Uh, if you search for this on, on Facebook, you probably find it and get a sense of what the video actually said. But you know, comment, shares, focus on those engagement metrics. And then of course, you know, these things work in concert to get people back to your site. So this is just an example of, you know, in the context of uh, so organic and social, you know, having a pretty good mix of both organic search traffic, social traffic, from these different sources is a it's it's a healthier diversified traffic profile than if you're trying to put all your eggs into the you know organic search basket or AdWords basket. You can generate uh, potential client inquiries and grow awareness through these social channels. Get people back to your site. Do retargeting campaigns. Really effective stuff. So uh, again, when you see your analytics and they show multiple sources of traffic, uh, including uh, social. I think that's a, a good metric for overall web presence health. Um, and then again, you can get some, Facebook provides some pretty good intelligence on the actual uh, video views. So you can, instead, in addition to seeing likes and, and shares and that kind of thing, you can actually see how many, how many people are watching your video, uh, watching it all the way through, new visitors, unique visitors versus repeat, uh, all really good stuff. And then so one more, I kind of talked about this earlier, so this is a, but this will give you at least a link and some other things to search on, on custom audiences. Uh, Facebook customizes what we're going to focus on, but Google has a custom audience uh, feature in AdWords as well. But the, the example I'm trying to show here is that if you use a CRM to track potential client inquiries, if you're using an email system that's linked to that, and you build a custom audience in Facebook and get them back to your site, you can do a retargeting campaign and then drive them, get them back into your, uh, you know, uh, your client journey in terms of, hey, is this someone that was a former client that might need my services again? Is this someone that was a former client who might refer to somebody new? But the, the point here is, is to use these channels in uh, you know, coordination because you can lower cost per clicks and you can re-engage people that you know you, that you already know you or have already worked with you and are going to be, you know, if you're doing a good job as a lawyer, are going to be some of your strongest advocates and referral sources. And so this is just an, another example of doing that. But the, the real point here is, is that now you've taken your AdWords click, which, you know, might have been $3 in this campaign without Facebook, and you can bring it down to, uh, I'm sorry, it's actually 50 cents on Facebook, $3 on AdWords. So you know, these were clicks in a campaign that otherwise were $50 or $60, but because they were brought back through AdWords from a retargeted list, uh, that you can bring your cost per clicks down. So the, the whole point is, is that there are ways to integrate the channels to make them work harmoniously and bring costs down. Which brings us to our final poll question, which is, and hopefully is obvious, do legal ethics rules apply in social media land? And the first uh, potential choice is no, social media is an ethics-free zone. Second option, no, so long as you your consultant posts for you. And number three, yes, the rules apply. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so everyone, please go ahead and conclude with your votes. And I'm going to close the poll and share our results. Okay, 99% said yes, the rules apply. And we have 1% saying it's an ethics-free zone. And no one is going for the consultant, 0% uh, on that one. Nice. So, uh, smart group again. Uh, you know, I, it should be obvious that the rules apply. Now, I will say, I'll give, I'll give this caveat in case the 1% person was thinking in this context. Uh, if you're posting things that uh, are not uh, legitimately regulated by the uh, ethics committee, then I think you can make a case, and I certainly... Uh, agree with that because I tend to think that there uh, a lot of the rules could use some updating. 
But I also say it's always better safe um, than sorry. And as we as we start to get through some of these rules, I think you'll get a sense of why it's pretty obvious that um, a lot of the there's a potential for problems. So these are some of the most these are the ABA model rules. Obviously, your state is going to be uh, potentially different, but might track the model rules, so we work with the model rules, so I don't have to go through 50 different versions. Um, confidential information with clients. So, you know, if you're sharing client confidences on your Facebook page, of course it's going to be subject to attorney discipline. Don't do that. That should be an obvious one, although we've, I've seen it happen. Um, two is communication concerning a lawyer's services. This is the more general catch-all. This is the one where some people will take issue with, is that if you make a communication but it's not about the lawyer's services, it might not be subject to regulation, and I certainly agree with that. Uh, and I certainly agree with the. Uh, if you go to actually, if you want to know some really interest, a, a great place to read, go to sociallyawkwardlaw.com or search socially awkward law with Josh King. Um, he covers this stuff and does a really nice job of it. So it help you know kind of have some of these conversations. Uh, of course, advertising. So if you're paying for ads online, whether they're social ads or search ads. Uh, this rule most definitely applies. Uh, direct contact with prospective clients. So if you're going around trying to find people uh, who have just recently been in an accident, um, you know that there are solicitation uh, prohibitions in certain states against that. And um, so that, that should be an obvious one that applies. And then communication of fields of practice and specialization. You know, if you, if you don't have a Supreme Court or state bar endorsement specialization in your state, you probably don't want to be using this these superlatives or specialized language. You know, I'm not going to get into all of the objectively verifiable, um, you know, material information stuff. I usually stick to some pretty basic rules: protect your clients, don't lie or mislead people online, uh, and always remember it's public and permanent. And that, and I think that there's going to be a new layer of that as we move into this idea of dark social. And as people move into this idea of using Facebook messaging apps and direct messages on Twitter, assume that it's going to be public and permanent because it's there's a even in the app because the app makes it feel like you're it's more hidden or private, uh, but there are so many instances of screenshots being taken or you know someone makes just you know subpoenas Facebook records so just. Play by these three rules, and I think you're usually safe. You know, if you have questions about that, contact your, your state bar. A lot of state bars have great resources on ethics, and of course, the rules are different uh, from state to state on a lot of these subjects. So you know, we can't make broad um, generalizations, even though I'm trying to do that with these three rules. Uh, I think this gives a pretty good guideline for getting started. So that takes us to questions. I finished a little bit early, but hopefully, we have some questions that I can help answer. If, I tend to go a little bit fast, and some of these things might be new to folks. So, if there are questions, yeah, please feel free. Yeah, we do have a ton of questions, so don't worry about that. Okay. Um, and questions are still coming in. Um, but before we get to that, um, if some of you have to leave us now, please do take note of three things before we get to those questions. My case offers a 30-day free trial. Um, but since you attended this webinar today, you get a, a bonus discount. So note that promo code in the bottom right corner, um, which is 10 G, so G Y I 16, for when you activate your account, and um, you'll get that discount. Secondly, when you close your webinar, a five-question survey will pop up. All it takes is answering these questions, and you'll be entered to win our $100 Apple gift card. And also, a few people did inquire, yes, you will receive this tomorrow. You'll receive an email with the recap, um, the slides, and the recording. It will be posted on our blog, and you'll also find out who the winner of the Apple gift card was. Um, so, Guy, for some of those questions, and they are still coming in, um, okay, what do you think about Yelp and Alvo, and how, how important is it to spend time um, building those out? Yeah, so uh, so it, just in case there's anybody that's not familiar, Yelp and Avo are uh, review sites. Uh, Avo is uh, specifically for attorneys, and they can, it can be, you know, in terms of, so the, the questions we usually get are this. You know, one, you know, should I claim my Avo profile because of the score? And the, the, for most lawyers, your 
you know, I, I can't remember what percent they're at, but they've almost got every lawyer in there. And so they're going to show up in searches for your name. And so again, going to this kind of idea of controlling your web presence, I always encourage people to participate there. Uh, and the, it's a since it's a review and rating site, you're going to get those, the same thing we talked about with Facebook, you're going to get those um, rich snippets with the stars when colleagues or uh, clients review you. Same thing with Yelp, very high authority. Um, there are some, you know, you want to check out your profile language, because uh, I know in Yelp there's some issues of specialization that might cause problems in certain states. But I generally say that when people search on your name, if those profiles are coming up, um, and, and or if you're just, you want to control the messaging, claim those profiles, send people there, you know, don't answer questions that you're not uh, competent to answer, and uh, you know, don't tr go try, you know, if you're licensed in one state, don't try to answer every question in the world and then just put a disclaimer that says, go talk to a lawyer in your state. But I do think that uh, participating there and uh, improving your profiles is generally a good thing, especially as it relates to when people search on your name or your firm's name. Great. Um, great answer, too. What do you recommend a Facebook budget should be for a solo firm on a monthly basis? So it's a really hard question to answer because it really depends on what your goals are. But I'll, I'll try to give some guidance in, in, through the lens of setting goals. Uh, like I said earlier, you can get clicks for pennies. And so put together what a specific goal is for a particular campaign. I'm not really a big meter running to nowhere uh, online, with whether it's ads or uh, social ads, paid search ads, or SEO for that matter, have some specific targets in mind. So you might say, if it's your first time doing it, you know, take $50 and pick one of the Facebook goals, uh, whether and probably you know, do some boosted content to see if you can get people to actually in, start to comment or engage. But there's really no rule because if you're a if you have a statewide law practice with firms in, or uh, offices in a variety of different uh, cities, you're, you should probably think about having a, a bigger budget that supports each of those communities. Um, and it, of course, it depends on your subject matter too. If you have a national practice, and you, you know, if you're Bill Marler and you want to gain more exposure that way, uh, starting on with some paid social ads might be a, a good thing to do. But the nice thing about Facebook ads that's different than Google is that you know everybody's fighting to be number one in the AdWords spot for any combination of practice area, city, and firm uh, or lawyer or whatever. And you know you're talking about a hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars a click in some practices. Facebook penny. So experiment, but set goals uh, and, and and research some of those things I'm talking about where you're using retargeting. So integrate. Facebook with email and retargeting and AdWords, and then start experimenting with some smaller budgets, fifty dollars, um, you know, for a seven day, fifty dollars over seven days, or fifty dollars over a month. You know, again, there's there's no really hard and fast rules, but the key is is to have a goal for it, and then define work backwards to how much you need to invest. In my opinion. Okay, great. Um, you're getting more questions in this webinar than. Most webinars we do, people are very engaged, so they've got That's lots good. of... That's good, and, and people can, should know that they can always... Uh, it's very easy to find my information online, so if they have follow-ups, certainly don't hesitate to contact me directly. It's no problem. Okay, perfect. And this goes back to one of your slides. Um, you had an example with the Levinson and Stefani uh, Facebook page. There mm -hmm. was the button for sign-up that links to their newsletter sign-up page, and mm -hmm. a couple of people asked, how do you, how do you get that sign-up button? So they there you so go. Uh, you sh I really like Mailchimp. Mailchimp uh, helps uh, do email marketing. Um, you know, people. I say email marketing, and people cringe because we're all faced with so much spam. But if you actually use email to uh, send emails to people who actually want your messaging, it's really really effective. So Mailchimp has an integration, like basically a, a out of the box click connect integration with Facebook. So all you really need to do is have a Facebook page, sign up for a MailChimp account. I think their base version is free until you get to a certain number of uh, subscribers. And then go in and click into MailChimp integrations, and then it's literally a couple clicks, and you can set that up and style your form and all that kind of thing. Um, you can search for MailChimp Facebook integration online, too, and it will have instructions on how to do that. 
Okay, great. And um, several questions also about ethics. Yeah. Um, do you have any up-to-date resources for checking ethics for social media? Um, people are asking, like, what states have ethics guidelines for social media? Yeah, so a lot of the states are in the process of revisiting uh, their how their their communications, the advertising and solicitation rules apply. Um, you know, if you were the first place to go is your state bar, right? Because a lot of state bars even have like ethics hotlines that you can call to ask a very specific question. Um, and, and I would say, just as a general matter, if you want a good social media as it applies to uh, lawyers and ethics online, check out Josh King's Socially Awkward. It's a really great resource. Um, and you know, he, I think he's even pretty open to even fielding uh, questions. The hard part is, is that you know, we'd have to go through a full analysis to talk about any particular ethics issue, and that's why I try to stick to those rules of protect your clients, don't lie or mislead. It's public and permanent. I know that's a lot of a lot of times that's not what people want to hear because it's more nuanced than that. But I, those will keep you out of most hot water. Um, but other than that, go to your state bar and you know, go to the ABA. The ABA has got a lot of good information. Their website's got a lot of good information. But again, they use the model rules for most of their examples. Uh, but they do have good examples. Uh, I know that Florida, uh, the Florida bar, even though if it, uh, you know, obviously that's going to apply to Florida lawyers, they're building out a lot of resources on ethics and interplay between ethics and social media. And California has come out with some um, pretty good, interesting examples as well. Uh, another good resource, I, I suppose, is uh, I'm, Will's going to hate me for this because he's going to get a bunch of emails and phone calls. But Will Hornsby at the ABA uh, is a really great is a great resource for ethics information and the interplay between ethics and the web. Okay, great. Um, is it necessary to put a disclaimer on online posting to ensure both that what is posted is not taken as legal advice and an attorney-client relationship is not established? Right, great question. Um, the answer, of course, is that it depends. It depends on what the message is, and it also depends on where you are. I think, it, from in my opinion, it, especially when you're talking about in the footer of a website, uh, putting the disclaimers that relate to submitting confidential information, the attorney-client relationship, make a lot of sense. Um, I actually we were contemplating writing this up, but there was an example, and I'm blanking on the exact state where the state uh, actually reprimanded a lawyer for not including um, particular disclaimer language in his AdWords ads. And I think that's actually, from what I understand, it's act they've actually changed course on uh, what the rule is now. So th my point is here is, is that it most it, where you can do it, and certainly where it's an advertisement about your services, right? So you're saying free consultation, you're saying contact me to discuss your divorce or whatever, like the, stuff like that. I think it's pretty obvious that the advertising rules apply. And so if your state has a rule on including attorney advertisement or a rule on specific language, you should follow that language. Of course, it, you know the, what's happening is, is that now lawyers are terrified of the state bars and so they decide I can't do anything on Twitter because I can't include the proper disclaimer language or I can't do anything on Facebook. And, and this is where this, you know, I'll go back to the 1% person who answered that the rules don't apply. You know, the rules apply, but they don't apply the same way depending on the message. So if you share client confidence, you're pretty pretty good case that you're violating the rules. If you're sharing information about your participation in Toys for Tots, I don't think that uh, you're running a foul in the, in the rules there. I don't think you need a disclaimer because I don't think I don't think that constitutes an ad. So that's the best I can really say. But again, the best advice is to consult your own state bar rules and your hotlines where they're available. Okay. Um, I like this question. Uh, programs to use. Are there any tips on streamlining social media accounts? Um, so right. you can minimize the time you use to post. It's a great question. Um, and so I'm going to, I'll give you the direct answer, the ones that I like. I, I like Hootsuite. Um, I, I use TweetDeck occasionally. But I'm going to, but here's the thing. Here's the caveat. Sprawl Social is good too, but here's the caveat. The more automated you make your social media posts across various platforms, the more inauthentic they look. In fact, there's a firm uh, that I know that has, uh, you know, someone that manages the uh, 
uh, LinkedIn profiles of a variety of the firm members and what happens is is that they all share the same post exactly the same time with the same message and it looks completely inauthentic and so I think that there are ways to use tools like Hootsuite you know scheduling uh, posts and scheduling tweets but the real power here is not in broadcast it's in engagement and so while Hootsuite might be useful if you're manage each of the, managing each of those profiles ac uh, across those different platforms uh, individually, I think it can be useful. But what I caution you against is linking all of them together. You know, you can, I, and if you're familiar with Hootsuite, you can load a message in, select all the profiles you want to post it to, and then launching it. And you got to remember, different people are following you in different uh, platforms, and not all of the, you know, if you're using hashtags or at replies on Twitter and you post those on LinkedIn or post them on Facebook, you're not necessarily going to get the at reply. You're going to get the at symbol and some Twitter handle. And again, it just looks like you've automated the process. So uh, I named some tools to answer you directly, but I think the bigger point here is, is that the, the power is from the engagement. And as a sub point of that, you don't have to sit on Facebook and Twitter all day to make this stuff work. You know, a few moments in the morning, a few moments on your commute, a few moments while you're waiting in motion call, a few moments at lunch, a few moments at the end of the day, that's, that can be enough to stay top of mind, uh, to have some conversations that are meaningful in terms of developing relationships. Great. That's great advice. Um, next question. Should we ask clients for recommendations on LinkedIn? All right. So, uh, again, that depends. The it depends on what state you're in. You know, some states have taken a pretty firm stance against, uh, or at least you know, creating potentially the that you have accountability for the content of what your uh, reviews say about you. And so, in that case, I'd say you know, be very sure that you're comfortable with what's being posted and that it's in your control before you even start to encourage them. But where it's permissible, yes, it's very, very effective when people see your profile on LinkedIn. And instead of, you know, and I think it's important too to note there are two different, uh, we'll call them, uh, well, one of them is called endorsements and one of them is called recommendations. I would focus more on the recommendations. People seem to pass out the endorsements pretty haphazardly and I think they've lost a lot of their credibility. Um, so, and another thing too is if you're going to leave uh, endorsements for other people, you know, and only endorse the, the lawyers that you actually know to be good or you've worked with. Uh, if clients are going to leave um, endorsements, I would, I would encourage them to, if I had to prioritize these things too, well, two things. One is look for the profiles that show up because it's hard enough, in certain practice areas, it's hard enough to get a client testimonial in general. Again, where it's permissible and stay as permissible. Go search your name and see what comes up. If your AVO profile is coming up prominently for searches on your name, start putting, uh, you know, sending them there. Look into Google My Business because Google My Business is, especially on search, is going to be one of the places that uh, is going to show up very prominently, especially if you've set it up for local business stuff. I don't want to go too much on that rabbit hole. Check out Moz Local. That's M-O-Z Local. Uh, they have all sorts of great information on learning how to set some of this local stuff up that includes Google My Business. But the bigger point here is send happy clients to the platforms that appear for searches on your name because those are the ones that are going to be most likely seen when people look you up. Okay, excellent. Uh, we have quite a variety of questions coming in. So this gentleman said that uh, social media has sent him almost exclusively individuals with no money looking for contingency representation. Mm -hmm. uh, he does appeals and needs people who can pay fifteen to 30000 for the engagement or business with more at stake and willing to spend more. Any strategies for attracting that different kind of clientele? Yeah, so and, and I don't want to be. I don't want to presume that I have any idea what kind of social uh, activity uh, this firm has been engaged in. But it's usually when I hear that it's the it's the firms that are advertising or that are um, you know posting something that. Is, is encouraging those kind of inquiries. You know, there's this common uh, thinking that everybody online is looking for free legal services and free answers to their questions. And my response to that is, yes, there are a lot of people that are doing that. That we are, this is the short attention span, 
uh, you know, people have expectations, economy. And so, but you can filter a lot of that out through your messaging, right? So if you don't want, if you are, you know, make it very clear with the messages that you use on your Facebook page, what the terms of your engagement are, um, you know, the, if, you're, if you're trying to appeal to a mass audience, you're going to get a lot of inquiries that might not be good fits. And then it's really about trying to efficiently, uh, you know, and politely and professionally say, you know, look, I'm just really not the right fit for you. And that might be the combination of something like, a, you know, some assistance, depending on what your firm looks like. Uh, but I would say focus on developing relationships with the people that are most likely to be uh, your referral sources. So if I'm an appellate lawyer, I'm looking to build relationships with lawyers that uh, are going to refer their, uh, you know, that don't do appellate work, that they can refer that to me, connect with them socially, stay top of mind with them. The same types of things you do networking offline, do those things on LinkedIn. But that's more of a, you know, a strategic play for what your firm looks like. And this goes back to the very beginning of all of this is, you've got to identify who the people are that you want to stay connected to. And so many people think it's just like, well, open up the floodgates to whoever comes through. Well, if you do that, if you say free consultation, you're going to get people requesting a free consultation. Like I, you know, that's one of the, uh, I think, misconceptions that a lot of lawyers have is, and again, I'm not saying that this particular lawyer is doing that, um, but the more specific and the more tailored you are to your audiences, the, the better you're going to filter a lot of that stuff out. Very good advice, and that ties into this question, the next question. Um, this woman has very good engagement with certain Facebook posts and receives numerous likes for her blogs. Um, she said, I know many are linking over to my website to view the entire blog, my ultimate goal. So what do I do with the people who like the post? Is there a way to notice that they have liked my post or to give them um, something back? Yeah, so the, um, I don't know if this is what uh, they're driving at, but I will just throw some ideas out there. If they just like the post on Facebook and they don't actually click through, you know, you've got Facebook insights to measure the likes. But, you know, I would say try to, to encourage some other thing, other engagement things like encourage people to share some comments. So, you know, pose questions in the in the post on Facebook. Do things like you know, give them a teaser, and then they click through to learn more. And then there's the other half of the equations. When they get back to your site or to your blog, what can you do? And that's where you get into things like, I think, considering retargeting if it's appropriate, getting people to subscribe to other lists. So, you know, if you're a, uh, just say like it's a divorce uh, post, if you can get people into to subscribe to regular tips or information, or, or if you just, have, you know, if you're the, a lawyer who likes to do to do cooking, you know, give, give people an opportunity to subscribe, to get email tips, to download things, to do other things at your website or blog, leave comments. Um, so ins inspire that more engagement, and then you can do things with that. You can obviously you can build a custom audience if you get their email. You can send them emails. You can build a custom audience on AdWords. You can do retargeting. Um, if you get uh, if you get more comments. You can start getting those people to share those comments across multiple platforms. So uh, I think that the, and, and it might be that if, the, if this uh, firm's already doing a lot of those things, I think the answer is keep it up, right? Try to do, maybe do some paid promotion to try to get a little bit more uh, exposure for it. But if you're getting comments, if you're getting shares, if you're getting clicks back to your site, and you're getting people to download things and subscribe, you're really more in the phase of tweaking messaging to uh, you know, looking at what's working, uh, analyze the posts, analyze the the Facebook posts and your actual blog posts to see which ones are doing the best in terms of engagement, and then figure out ways to do more of that because it's obviously your your audience is telling you, hey, I really like what you're doing. I'd like to get more of it. Okay, um, Gee, just so you know, you have a lot of people not asking questions but just telling you what a great job you're doing. So pass well, I appreciate that, that. and thank you all for for attending. I really appreciate it, and I hope uh, you learned at least one thing. I think they've learned a lot, and I, we do have many more questions, but time for just one last one. Um, asking advice on the best way to respond or not respond to negative reviews on Yelp or another rating site. 
yeah, this is a whole can of worms. Um, and again, the, you know, the number one is to remember, especially when you get to negative, negative reviews from an actual client, that your professional obligation is to that client, number one. And so going uh, and starting a flame war with a client and insulting the client uh, is a surefire way to get yourself in trouble. Uh, so don't do that. Uh, again, Josh King's a great resource. He's got all sorts of stuff on how and when or if to even respond. But I'll just make a couple points. Number one is don't respond emotionally. You know, if it's a if it's not a client, then you have options uh, for getting the getting it removed because a lot the terms of a lot of the sites, including Google and Yelp, are that they actually have to be uh, customers of the business. And so if you can show that they weren't actually your client, you can get them uh, taken down. But assuming it's a assuming it's just an unhappy client, you know we can't please all the people all the time. You know a lot of law practices are dealing with people in very uh, emotional and uh, serious uh, personal situations. And so sometimes you're just going to have a client that didn't have a good experience. And really the best thing you can do is to say, you know, I'm really sorry you had this experience. Please contact me uh, so that we can talk about it. Now, that's not going to be the right advice for every situation. Some people, you're better off just leaving it alone because you don't want to incite them to do more. Um, and you've got to take this on a case-by-case -case basis. But, you know, going on blast against clients is always a bad idea in my opinion. But at the same time, I think it's also important to keep perspective that, if your profiles have you know, 20 happy clients and one unhappy client, just like we do with reviews in other capacities, people put that in perspective. And so when people go online and say something outrageous, you know, that's going to give there's going to put a lot less credence into that online review, especially when you have a bunch of happy clients and a bunch of other lawyers or colleagues that are saying, you know, look, this person is really the type of person we want to work with. That was the best way to answer that. I think it is tricky. Um, well, thank you so, so much. That was a very informative webinar, Guy, and thank you to all who attended. You will receive an email tomorrow um, with the recap and recording, and thanks for joining us, and we'll hopefully see you all next month. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, Stephanie. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.